And so, you know, there is power in, le in leveraging buying cooperatives and working in places and spaces where schools are already buying their food um, and really, you know, removing that burden for folks while also supporting our local food system. In this episode, Tammy Howard, a sustainable agriculture specialist with the National Center for Appropriate Technologies Rocky Mountain West Regional Office in Butte, Montana, talks with Allison Patrick of the Feed Our Future Initiative in Ohio. The Feed Our Future Initiative began as a pilot project in northeastern Ohio to help schools feed students healthy foods and support the local food economy. It has since spread to schools around the state. Tammy and Allison talk about the program and about how important personal relationships are in developing school markets for farmers. Let's listen. Hello, my name is Tammy Howard. I'm a sustainable agriculture specialist with the National Center for Appropriate Technology. And I'm excited to talk today with Allison Patrick from the Feed Our Future initiative um, based in Northeast Ohio. Um, so welcome, Allison. Hi, thanks for having me today. Excited to be here. Great, yeah, we're excited to talk to you about um, your work with Feed Our Future. Um, so um, maybe you could just start off by um, telling us a little bit about the Feed Our Future initiative and um, just briefly describe your work with them. Sure, so Feed Our Future actually was a pilot project of our health department over 10 years ago and really started to thinking, think about how we could not only support our school districts in serving healthier meals to kids, but also how we could support our local food economy in the process. And what started as a pilot project with one school district and one farm has today morphed into a uh, both regional <laughs> Uh, effort and also um, to beyond our borders in Northeast Ohio into other parts of our state and some of our surrounding states. And we've really taken the opportunity to think about um, that every child, whether it's in our county or in a surrounding community, really deserves access to fresh and healthy and when available local foods. And, and really how we then um, work with students to you know, make good healthy choices for themselves and then really what the impact of those choices are both in their school community and in their surrounding communities. And so we've really been very thoughtful in how we provide turnkey solutions to schools to achieve that, how we engage our students and parents as consumers of local food, and then how we really bring um, supporting resources and tools to our food system and our food producers really for, you know, the collective good. Great, that's that's a great um, description and um, and and a lofty uh, mission. <laughs> um, but I so with the pilot, did that? You said there was one school district and then one farm that you worked to connect um, and. Was that with a smaller school district and a smaller farm, or um, did you did you go big at first? Um, how did that? <laughs> maybe you could describe that first pilot and how it sure. got from there. Uh, it's one of our favorite. So we played farm to school matchmaker, and um, and as a part of our work at the time, we sent a survey out to the thirty one public school districts in our county and said, hey there's this emerging program called Farm to School. Tell us how you buy food, tell us about how you serve food, and would you have any interest in serving as a pilot? And of the 31 school districts that we sent the survey to, one school district said, yep, we're in. And the other 30 told us we were crazy. And we then replicated that same process to any um, grower, that I could find an address for within 120 miles of our county in Northeast Ohio. And we said, hey, tell us about how you grow food and who you sell to and would you have any interest in working with a school district? And of the 53 surveys we sent, I got one response. That one response um, that was willing to jump in with both feet and to um, say, let's figure out how to make this work. And the beauty in the marrying of the process was that farm just happened to drive past that school district to deliver food to their restaurant customers within the city of Cleveland. 
And probably the best story that we tell is, you know, this process wasn't driven by an action plan. It wasn't driven by a grant deliverable. We, um, the food service director and I drove out to the farm. And once we met the grower, the three of us sat on their patio on the porch overlooking the field. And we were like, how do we make this happen? And so it was really this really organic evolution of a program for a school district that at that time, predominantly over half of the kids in that district um, participated in free and reduced meals. And um, it was a district of about 4,300 kids that mm, about 1,500 were participating in the school meal program at that time in some way. Um, and so, you know, we really just started to think about how we could make this happen. And the district was coming at this from an initial micro purchase perspective and said, you know, we'll start with apples and lettuce because those are things that are familiar to us to serve. And we will, you know, pay plus or minus, you know, 10 cents here or there for the product and let's just see what happens. And the plan was to start in one cafeteria and rotate it every week and just see what the reaction from the kids was. And six weeks later, they issued a bid and entered into a formal program and were buying direct almost 300 pounds of local produce a week from the farm. Now, it was a unique situation in the sense that the food service director happened to be an executive chef. So dealing with whole product was not unfamiliar to him and then how you menu that um, and you know get kids excited about that. Um, was not unfamiliar to him. It was very unfamiliar to his staff. So there were some, um, you know, relationship building and training and, and things we needed to do, take care of on that end. But, you know, at the end of that first year, we all looked at each other and like, wow, we really did this. And um, for the next four years, we really worked very intensively with that district and implemented a full service comprehensive farm to school model. And it was everything from school gardening to farm to school policy, language and their wellness policy, to um, we implemented a garden based curriculum throughout the district in the third grade. Uh, as, as the health department and as Feed Our Future, we did grant writing and brought in salad bars and helped the district write a USDA farm to school grant that really helped them from a kitchen equipment and training perspective. Okay. And that ultimately culminated in a group of those kids going to the White House and harvesting the garden with um, Michelle Obama, which was beyond our wildest dreams. Um, and, you know, while that served as a really intensive pilot, it also served as great motivation for the other 30 districts that told us that we could never make this work. And it really started um, to force us to think about, you know, what working on a regional level could look like. And that's really the basis for how Feed Our Future was formally created and, and grown into today. Yeah, that's that's a great um a great story on how um you know districts all over the country have um started small and seen things grow as as successes are you know as success is realized with producers um and and so is that school district now procuring from multiple farms or is it still that just one-on-one -on -one relationship with that one farm um that that district in particular still utilizes that farm, but they have um, expanded to other local producers uh, and have maintained, they've had some changes in leadership, but they have maintained um, their local procurement piece. And really what the, that pro pilot project really taught us is for our work, procurement is the hardest thing to do. And, and just based on our experience, that was it procure, local food procurement really became the core of our work because we just recognize that not every child in our community has access to food, good, healthy food, especially, you know, if you have that experience and, and it's one of my other favorite experiences about the pilot, when you have a child running up to you saying, I thought I could only get this kind of food at Chipotle or you're standing in a school cafeteria with Farmer Floyd and you have kids running up to him saying, hey, where's your food? It tastes better, we want it back. You know, it was out of season. 
Like it was really those moments that hit home for us that at the core of what we had to do was really focus on the procurement piece. Not that educating kids about food isn't important and not that school gardens aren't important. But if that was the route that we took first, we would really have limited impact in our overall mission because kids were still going to have trouble accessing that type of food. And so, um, you know, we as a Feed Our Future leadership team and group came together and said, you know, we're going to go all in on procurement. It's the hardest thing to do, but the benefit of that long term was well worth the investment and focus on it. And then we bring in these, you know, experiences and education once that food is in place for kids. Yeah, and I, so I'm curious. Um... I mean, yeah, that that seems to be pretty typical of, of lots of um, school districts throughout the country is, you know, trying to create those connections in the procurement world between the, the producer and um, and the food service director. And so um, how have you been able to um, grow the program and the procurement um, with producers in your region? Have you like um, specifically um, done a lot of lot more matchmaker stuff like you were describing before or has it um, has have the schools started to reach out and maybe you could describe that evolution? Sure. So we actually went a completely different route um, as school districts started to say, okay, you've, you know, proof of concept, this can work in Ohio, because that it was a lot of the challenge initially, it wasn't even cost or the procurement piece, it was, you know, the perception that the seasonality in Ohio is just not conducive to school meals. So um, we, you know, we had a lot of, we spent a year doing focus groups with our other food service directors and really trying to understand you know, what were they really interested in buying and what what were they already spending on produce in general? And then what was the best way for us to move forward? Were the districts interested in a direct relationship? Was there a different path for us to go? Um, so once we had some initial information, we, we held a couple, couple producer town hall meetings and trainings and just kind of said, you know, of the districts we engaged with, you know, they're spending a million dollars on produce. And even if we just shifted, you know, 10 or 15 or 20% of that, you know, this is what this could look like for you. What is our real opportunity? And then not uncommon, you know, you get into all the, well, we don't understand how to work with a school and what do school districts really want? And so, you know, our stars, really, our farm to school stars really just kind of aligned. So the district that we piloted in, we were so fortunate that the superintendent was just so supportive of the work and really believed in this is what kids needed. And it, he transitioned from being the superintendent of a district to an executive director of a school buying cooperative. Yeah. And so we had this opportunity to come to him and to say, um, you know, Dr. Zelly, you purchase, you know, all kinds of goods and services for school districts. Would you? you know, jump in with both feet with us and pilot what a farm to school bid could look like from a buy-in cooperative perspective. And without hesitation, he said, let's figure out how to make this happen. So, you know, really what that allowed us to do is to remove that administrative burden from our directors and say, you know, from issuing, drafting specs, issuing specs, awarding specs, and uh, it you know, removed all of those pieces parts. And it also provides clarity on the producer side because we're saying this is exactly what we want. And these are the grading specs that you know, we need you to let us know that you can do or not do. And so it's been a win-win, not without its learning experiences, but it's been a win-win for everybody. So um, it has been a partnership that we are still so appreciative of, and Dr. Zelly is still there today. Um, and we started small. Uh, the very first year we did it, we focused on fruit, and it was predominantly apples because we knew that you know school districts serve apples all day long and all year long. Um, and we limited it to just Cuyahoga County, and because we had no idea what the supply and demand was going to be. 
And uh, so we did that proof of concept. And then the next year we expanded that bid to do uh, whole on process fruits and vegetables. And then we expanded um, the eligibility to the membership of the cooperative. And then we started to hear from schools, well, we don't want just whole product. What are our other uh, opportunities? And so the bid continues to evolve over time. And today we solicit responses for whole unprocessed fruits and vegetables, minimally processed fresh and frozen fruit, and then what we call a value add. So in our, the bid process has allowed us to do a couple of things. Um, our bid is anchored around our Feed Our Future Harvest of the Month program. And that program was developed by school in conjunction with school districts and really coming from the perspective of what are the nine most common things that school districts are serving on their menus that we know are grown in Ohio. And so we anchor the bid around that program and we solicit, uh, you know, supply from producers to meet the harvest items. And then on the back end, we have created a whole suite of turnkey solutions and assets that we then make available to our participating school districts so that they can do the education pieces in their classroom or in their school community. So that's been a really great um, partnership. The benefit on the producer side has been that, you know, the price is the price. So when a responsive and responsible bidder, you know, submits their, and if they're successfully awarded, that price is the price. So it's a win-win on both accounts. You know, the producer doesn't have, there's no fluctuation in the, in the market. Uh, so the schools aren't, you know, wondering what they're paying and the producer is not wondering what they're getting. Like the price is set for the entire school year. And, um, so, you know, once we go through this process and award vendors, school districts, the administrative burden is done for them. And all they have to do is, you know, if they choose to set up an account with the approved vendors and, and purchase. Um, the other thing we put in the bid is a geographic preference. And so um, we have a tiered, uh, tiered approach in our bid. And um, in terms of our value added products, we really say that, you know, for us, it's not, it's more than just about having an address in our community or in our state. And so our value added portion of our bid targets products that are both an Ohio based company, as well as 50% of the ingredients in that product are Ohio grown or processed. So we've been able to expand our bid even further and uh, take advantage of opportunities, again, for products that schools are already used to purchasing. Um, but you know, if they choose to support a local vendor in that purchase, that option is available for them. Great. Um, and so you were describing um, the, the turnkey solutions and assets for um, the school districts um, that, are involved with the buying cooperative. So is that um, we have a harvest of the month program here in Montana as well. And that, you know, they provide like educational materials and posters associated with the product with the harvest of the month. Is that what you were referring to? Yes. So those are some of the assets that are available. So uh, for any school district that takes the Feed Our Future pledge, so that means that they're committed in their district to supporting local food in some way, we make available our logo. So they are able to use, say, we're a Feed Our Future school district. This means that you know we are committed to not only kids knowing about where their food comes from, but that they also have access to local foods. And so they're able to use that logo in their menus, in their district newsletters. So it really becomes a turnkey marketing tool for them to really promote that they are invested in supporting local food and the health of kids in some way. We also then have a suite of materials available. So we do have our harvest of the month posters. We provide the districts with a seasonality chart that they use for menu planning. So while we might feature tomatoes in September because that's peak season for them, you know, we also encourage districts to see the other months that tomatoes are available and think about ways that they can include that in their work. And our posters are tailored. We have different messaging on the posters, but it's a consistent cohesive look. So we communicate a little differently to our younger students and scholars than we do our older students and scholars. So that's available. 
Um, we provide districts with harvest of the month recipes and they are scaled for both a school meal service. So we provide them with crediting information and serving size and scale, uh, scaled recipes for uh, 50 servings or more. And then we also have the home version of those recipes. So the goal is to begin promoting and working with families or other community organizations on how, you know, what we're seeing in school, we can start seeing at home or in after school or, you know, in other places that we share meals and, and cook with other folks. And so we provide that to our districts. We have fun stuff. So we want kids to, you know, talk about what they're uh, seeing and, and just fun things. So we do tattoos and little pins and stickers and, you know, just some of that fun stuff to bring awareness to, you know, our harvest. And then um, we have our recipe videos. So if you can imagine the three minute tasty style videos you might find online, um, we took our top eight recipes and created uh, three minute recipe videos for our school districts and our families. So uh, they are used in trainings for staff and again are shown in the classroom and at home um, again as ways to get people excited about making chopped asparagus salad or apple crisp using local apples. So those have been some really fun opportunities that we have been able to um, create and deploy out into the community. We have some other things in the works too. We're really thinking about a digital local food curriculum um, and uh, bringing school gardening and youth voice uh, into the work in some exciting projects that we have coming down the pike. So it's been a really rewarding and win-win and experience and really getting kids and schools and families all excited about food. Yeah, and so so part of the um, bringing the farm to school project that you were at our train the trainer um, has been <clears throat> um, trying to help producers really um, understand the procurement process and then um, and then access even if it's just from those initial micro purchases and, and helping to grow their, their farm to school market channel. So, so I was wondering if you could describe, um, are the, the, the producers selling into the buying cooperative? Are they like a certain scale or are they all over the map in terms of scale? And um, it sounds like your, your products are pretty much straightforward in the bidding process, but just wonder um, how you're um, handling that with the producers in Ohio. So for our buying cooperative bid, we don't have any farms that are directly responding uh, in the traditional like vegetable sense. I would say farms that are responding and participating in the bid our, our orchards, our orchards have capacity to work with multiple school districts. Um, so the way the bid flows out is that uh, school districts, you know, commit, check a box that say they're interested in participating in the bid. So I want to say this year, there's over 100 school districts in the region. Um, and so for the from the perspective of the bid, we have orchards that will apply as a direct relationship. But the majority of the food that goes out to our schools is actually through the Oberlin Food Hub. And the Food Hub then goes out and recruits, you know, small and medium sized farms into the Food Hub that they'll then aggregate and deliver um, out to the districts. And so, you know, the districts have one place that they go to place an order and they don't have to worry about, you know, placing multiple orders or opening multiple purchase orders. Um, so that has really, the Food Hub has been a tremendous benefit and a tremendous partner in getting local food into our districts. The other two um, vendors that we have for next school year are uh, the Pizza Bagel Lady. So she is a famous uh, food, Ohio food business based in Cleveland at the West Side Market and has gone through the process of making a child nutrition approved, taking her famous pizza bagel and making it child nutrition approved for a school menu. And so she uses um, local, uh, her tomato sauce is all from local tomatoes and local herbs and local ingredients. Um, she uses uh, local cheese 
And then um, she does a whole grain flour. And so she is an approved vendor this year. Um, we also have uh, Dogo's, which is a company in uh, about an hour south of us that is working with schools and they make an all local breakfast bar for school breakfast menus and um, breakfast for lunch type menus and some other uh, school compliant products. The Food Hub, in addition to their uh, fruits and vegetables that they aggregate and supply, also work with a company out of Athens, Ohio, so about three hours, three and a half hours south of us, but they do a tortilla chip. And so for the districts that are serving taco bars, um, Shagbark makes a compliant tortilla chip and they're the best corn tortilla chip we've any of us have ever had. So, uh, and then we also have other items available that are applesauce and yogurt and um, some of those other value added products. And again, that's a lot of that is coming through the food hub. So rather than, you know, the bid is certainly open to multiple awards and multiple vendors, but then you then look at the number of delivery sites in a district and get into logistics and order minimums. Um, the trend in our state even is for districts to go through buy-in cooperatives because again, uh, the administrative piece is taken care of for them. So, you know, it's really been an advantage to have a food hub and, you know, moving forward, our goal is to look at how do we get more producers connected to the food hub. Um, there are smaller, you know, private schools that are dipping their toes in a direct relationship, but the predominant trend is how do you work through a buying cooperative? And a solution we see for that is how do we feed more producers into the food hub? So um, with the pizza bagel and Dogo's folks, I'm just wondering how they, um, they were able to um, uh, meet the specifications required by the school? Did they work with the Department of Ag or, or a regional processing kitchen to make sure they um, were meeting the specifications outlined by the, the purchasing cooperative and the schools? Sure, so I'll um, speak to the example of the pizza bagel lady, Terry. Um, Terry actually attended our producer training that we held as part of our USDA Farm to School grant. And after the training, I got a phone call and said, I really feel like the pizza bagel has a place in school meals. How do we make this happen? And so we were able to pull a few of our food service directors together and say, you know, in order for this to, to, to make this work and make this happen, what do, how do we best need to move forward? And so, you know, we had conversations around, here's what your nutrition, you need to have a nutrition label and it helps if it's child nutrition label approved. And, you know, in order for us to be able to claim this as part of our meal, here is the best way for us to get it credited. Um, because initially when you looked at the pizza bagel without, you know, meeting the whole grain requirements or anything, it was, well, how would we get this credited? And so there was a whole discussion about, you know, it's too high in sodium and the cheese makes it this. And, you know, so it was really an, I wouldn't say an, it was a collaborative process in, you know, here are the changes that would need to be made to this product for it to be compliant. And, oh, by the way, we need to get it at a price point <laughs> for a school district to be able to, you know, really consider in terms of what a total plate cost is. And it was really, you know, the willingness of Terry who really believes in feeding kids good food that um, she, she took everything that and all the feedback that was given to her. And she said, okay, I think that I'm ready to take it to the next step. Where do we go from here? And, you know, and it's just such an advantage and be, as being a USDA farm to school grantee, because it has just, you know, really made it easy to reach out to the experts and say, you know, where, where do you suggest we go? Where, where's our next step? And do you know anybody that can help us? And so Terry and I got uh, referred to the Midwest office uh, to look at, you know, what does it take to get a child nutrition label and what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were really able to advise her, like you could go one direction or you could go this other direction. And if you go this other direction, it's going to be a really heavy, heavy um, fiscal investment for you without knowing, you know, how school districts will buy your product. And so um, she went with their first option. So she has a child nutrition label. And, and then it became, hey, Overland Food Hub, Terry has this product, you know, you all are 
uh, delivering to schools, what, what are the partnership opportunities here? And so Oberlin Food Hub and Terry have now come together and the Oberlin Food Hub will deliver the pizza bagels to the school districts that order it. And, you know, and, and Terry has learned a ton along the way and is now, um, because of the way things are credited and, you know, just for ease and efficiency is now creating them as a two pack for schools. Sure. And, you know, she also brings the value added experience of she will go into a classroom and talk to kids about, you know, carbohydrates and what they do in your body. And she'll actually go in and make bagels and, the, and show kids how to make bagels and really talk to them about, you know, the way her pizza bagel is made and the farm that the tomatoes come from that she takes and then makes the sauce. And it's just been, you know, she has just jumped in and really been willing to do some of the sweat equity to understand what does it really mean to work with a district. And, you know, this past year in COVID, we had an opportunity to do a local menu takeover pilot as a part of Feed Our Future. And we designed seven all grab and go menu concepts that were all local for our schools under pandemic feeding. And one of them took advantage, it was a pizza bagel with uh, local fresh cut vegetables. And the really cool thing is that the one district we work with didn't realize that that pizza bagel came less than five minutes from their school. Wow. And it's just been this, you know, really amazing um, opportunity. But, you know, Terry, Terry put in the sweat equity and to her credit really gained a lot of credibility with schools by doing that. Now, you know, that's not feasible in every scenario, but that's just one example. It has worked really well. And I just want to clarify. So when you were talking about um, working with the Midwest office, were you talking about the Midwest, like the Food and Nutrition oh. Service Office of Community yes. Food Systems and their regional lead? Yeah, they can yes. be really great resources. So in helping to determine recipes and all of that kind of stuff. So, okay, great. Um, yeah, and so... You said that um, Terry was really willing to do that like sweat equity piece. And I, so I'm just um, wondering um, when you're working with producers, which it sounds like is mainly through that food hub piece, does the food hub make those arrangements with producers to actually kind of close the loop at the school end and, um, you know, add value in terms of uh, like um, educating students about their products and um, helping producers or excuse me, helping students understand um, where the food is coming from. Um, the Food Hub does that to a degree. And Dave from the Food Hub is great. He actually is a a uh, former culinary background and has worked in Head Start programs and, and in kitchens, you know, for a good long while. And so Dave is really great about promoting where the food is coming from and will go in and again, sweat equity, will provide culinary training to the food service staff. Um, what we are working on together is actually uh, Feed Our Future Farm series. And so we're really trying to put faces with food and uh, we are taking um, some extremely well-received and loved ideas from our folks and friends in Colorado. And as part of the farm series, we're creating farmer trading cards to get, they're actually at the print shop right now, and they're going to go live uh, this school year. And uh, we're creating farmer, farmer profiles, grower profiles, and, you know, just fun like curriculum pieces to be able to give schools to really start to put faces with food for kids. Um, and the farms that we're featuring are the uh, eight farms right now as an initial run that are providing most of the food to our school districts. Um, we've also worked with the Food Hub to host Meet the Farmer Days and Meet the Farmer Nights and some of those other um, you know, more experiential opportunities for kids. Um, so, you know, we, you know, it's been a really good partnership, but, you know, we also know that the food hub's job is to aggregate food and <laughs> deliver food and, you know, all of those other behind the scenes things that people take for granted for in terms of how food gets to your doorstep. And so, you know, we have just tried and worked really well together to be able to tell that story uh, in, in a collaborative way. Yeah, that, that is great. Yeah, because I think 
people don't realize how much effort goes into that aggregation process of trying to get the smaller farms to, mm -hmm. you know, to an, uh, a mass that is affordable for the school district and at the size and scale and, and, um, and uh, specifications needed. So yeah, that's great. Um, um, so um, yeah, I just have a few more questions um, about, again, just because this is mainly like the producer facing um, resource. So do you have any, um, any, or, or could you help explain what you wish producers knew about selling to schools? Sure, I mean, I think we've learned a few things through our work. Um, you know, the first being is to the extent that you can, understand the type of food that schools are already serving. So I have a great example for this. I get a phone call one day. I have 300 pounds of cubed butternut squash ready to go. Why can't I get a school to buy it? And so then you unpack that a little bit and you say, well, first, it's not part of the bid specification. So they would have to either choose to, you know, micro purchase it, or they would have to write a standalone specification for cubed butternut squash. Then the next question we often talk about is, well, what would the school do with the butternut squash? Because it's really not a product that school districts serve. And it's not to say that they can't, and it's not to say that they won't, but you know, there's just some thinking about you know, the use of that in a cafeteria. And if that's really the best investment that a district can make in their limited dollar to you know, buy, buy cubed butternut squash and not really be sure what to do with it and not really, you know, be sure if kids are going to eat it. So it definitely helps to understand that what school districts are serving and what you're able to offer. And, and really what we like to say at Feed Our Future is like, how do you make it hard for them to say no? Like it's easy to say no to butternut squash sometimes, but it's not so easy to say no <laughs> if you're coming to them with cherry tomatoes, which is something they're already serving. Mm -hmm. So really just having an understanding and appreciation of what schools are already serving just you know makes that conversation easier. The other thing to understand, and, and this has been a learning curve for the producers that we've worked with is, you know, it's not a producer's job to do procurement. It's not a producer's job to follow the rules. It's the school food service director's job to do that. And that is a not, it's not something I would want to do every day. So I have tremendous appreciation for their ability to feed thousands of children a day and follow, you know, all of the rules and regulations that go along with that in order to get their reimbursement. But what that comes with is, you know, food service directors aren't trying to not work with people, um, but that, you know, if there is an issue with the way they procure food, you know, they could get audited, they can put up, be put on corrective action. And we have had situations where that has happened. Um, so, you know, again, understanding that it's not just as easy for a school district to say, yeah, I'll take three pallets of watermelon. Um, you know, there's a process to get to that three pallets of watermelon, and they're not being difficult in just saying, no, I just can't buy that from you today. You know, there's, a, there needs to be an understanding of there's just, there's a process to buy food, whether we like it or not, there's a process. And so, you know, coming from this place of, you know, how do we do this together? How can we help each other? Um, you know, is what we have found has been just a really great way to have any of these conversations and just to be flexible you know our school districts had a great learning curve a few years ago where you know as a part of our bid process we had watermelon and we had cucumbers and some other products that the schools were expecting you know ready to buy the start of the school year well we had horrible weather tremendous rain so what happened price the price had to go up otherwise the, the food hub couldn't you know it, it wasn't didn't make financial sense for the food hub to even offer it. And so the food hub had to go to the buying co-op and said, hey, we know we said it was going to be this price, but due to X, Y, Z reason, unfortunately, we're going to have to bump it up to this price. And they received the permission to do that. And, you know, the schools had to learn like there is risk and seasonality and, and you know, you need to understand that these things happen and they're not beyond, they're not within anybody's control. And, 
Um, so just that flexibility and understanding has gone a long way uh, in terms of making these relationships happen. Also, what I hear you saying, um, you know, we in our work with farmers and any kind of marketing channel, you have to be somewhat prepared and do your research and communicate with the buyer. And it, I don't, I don't think schools are <laughs> any different. If, in, in fact, it seems like you need to do a little bit more of that upfront communication and, and, um, and. Uh, relationship building before you can expect to sell a pallet of um, <laughs> a butternut squash that's cubed. Or <laughs> yep. The other thing that I have appreciated with the producers that we have worked with is they're also not afraid to communicate, like, here's what I need for this relationship to work. And one of my favorite lines is, you know, there's no option one for accounting and option two for billing and option three for customer service. Like I am accounting, I am billing, I am customer service and I am growing your food. Um, and in order, you know, and that's the relation, that's a great relationship to have. But in order for this relationship to also work, you can't have your deliveries on Monday, Wednesday and Friday. You know, I have to come on Tuesday because that's what makes the most business sense for me. And so, I've appreciated the producers and the businesses that we've worked with that haven't been afraid to say, you know, and speak up for on their behalf, uh, you know, what they need to make it work. And so it's just, it's this wonderful give and take that, you know, organically happens and um, has, you know, just really worked out well here. Great. And I think that's a great way to end it, unless you think, is there anything else that you want to add in terms of, I had, I, I feel like you touched on most of the questions um, in the Food Hub discussion. Um, anything else you feel like you want to add to the discussion? I would just say that if there is any interest in understanding the ins and outs of working with buying cooperatives. We are so happy to share our process and help folks think through that. I can tell you that we've been so blessed with a partnership in the southern part of our state with uh, Green Umbrella, which is a community organization, that they are you know, now moving our buying cooperative process into that region of the state. And so, you know, there is power in, le in leveraging buying cooperatives and working in places and spaces where schools are already buying their food um, and really, you know, removing that burden for folks while also supporting our local food system. So, you know, we're here to share the process. We're here, we're so happy to help you, anybody interested, think through things. You know, and the Feed Our Future materials are state neutral. So if folks would, you know, ever be interested in bringing the work to your community, uh, we are so happy and here to help. That's great. And that's a very generous offer. You might, you might be surprised at um, the response rate, but um, <laughs> uh, there are a few logistics to work out in that, but it's, it's here. It, it's, it's here, you know, and we are just so passionate and driven that, you know, every child in our community and beyond deserves this opportunity and this access and so it definitely seems like the buying cooperative was the key to um, expanding farm to school in a big way in your state. So, um, Absolutely. yeah, well, thank you for sharing your story, Allison, and um, and uh, best wishes in getting the um, more local food into um, uh, kids mouths. So, um, yeah. Okay, that's a, that's a wrap. Well, that's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. Additional information can be found in the notes. And please leave a comment and don't forget to subscribe. We'd also appreciate it if you could fill out a brief survey to tell us what you thought of the podcast. It helps us improve our content. A link to the survey is included in the notes. I'm your host, Rich Myers. Alan Puckett and I produce Atra Voices from the Field at the National Center for Appropriate Technologies headquarters in Butte, Montana, with support from the USDA Rural Business Cooperative Service as part of NCAT's Atra Sustainable Agriculture Program.
Any opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this recording are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the view of the USDA or INCAT. We'll catch you again next week, and until then, keep on farming.